Well, good morning. I want to welcome you to the uh, Washington Labs Academy webinar for today. Uh, my, uh, my name is Mark Mayer, as I said, and I'm pleased to uh, welcome you to our session this morning. We have developed our webinar series to deal with some of the technical and administrative issues uh, that many of our customers face on a day-to-day -day basis. We recognize that engineering challenges can be complex, and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping uh, details. First of all, I hope everyone can see the uh, title slide uh, for today's presentation on HAZ-based safety engineering. Uh, in the presentation part of our webinar series, uh, we'd like to reach out to our uh, customers, potential customers, on a wide variety of topics. Uh, I have everyone's microphone muted to keep the meeting quality as high as possible. And the recording presentation is underway in one week since all of these. A training certificate is sent to attendees of the live presentation. A full screen may be, uh, view may be preferred, just like view uh, from in the pull down menu, and then full screen, and then if you hit the escape key, you'll go back to the normal view. We encourage questions during the presentation. Uh, you can submit them. Uh, question by enabling chat or the Q&A icon at the top of the screen and type in question to host. And at the end of the presentation, I'll go through those as time allows. We'd like to hear from you. At the end of this presentation, you can see our contact information. And you will be receiving a PDF uh, copy of this with all the uh, contact uh, emails. Um, or you can just uh, send an email to academy at wll.com. And, uh, or you can send an email to me at markm, M-A-R-K-M, at wll.com. We estimate the bulk presentation will take about 45 to 50 minutes, and we'll have about 10 minutes to be for questions. So I am your speaker today. I'm the Business Development and Communications Manager, American Certification Body, but I also am responsible for the training uh, for the Washington Labs Academy. I'm a IEEE member, senior member, and an active committee member for the uh, annual IEEE EMC uh, Society Symposium. And I'm a past president of the IEEE Product Safety Engineering Society. I spent over 30 years working in the regulatory compliance engineering field, starting with a 20 year career at Dell and then uh, working at third party labs since then. I've been covering specialties of VNC and EMI. Uh, wireless telecom, product design, uh, product safety for the, and design for the environment and quality management systems. I have two degrees from uh, Texas State University, uh, one in mathematics and the other in business marketing. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, launch into our agenda here. So uh, today we're going to be discussing is the standard uh, IEC, the international standard 62368-1, or the Hazard Based Safety Engineering Test Standard. Uh, this also has a uh, underwriters laboratory version, UL 62368-1, with some slight differences. But uh, I'm going to be covering the international version, the IEC version today specifically, and. Um, we're going to look at the product safety engineering overview of how this uh, standard came into being and uh, what uh, what makes it different uh, from the uh, current standards we've been looking at um, for uh, ITE and audio video equipment. The uh, standard itself, we're going to look at the scope and definitions, the uh, client's approach and options, the hazard evaluations, and online resources and references for you. So uh, prior to the uh, HBSE, or Hazard Based Safety Engineering Center, coming to uh, development, there's two international uh, uh, electrotechnical commission, that's the IC technical committees, which are referred to as TCs, responsible for developing and updating product safety test standards. Uh, the IAC technical committee 74, which were data processing equipment and office machine, Product safety standards. This led to the development of the uh, 6950 standards that we're so familiar with for uh, ATE equipment. The IC Technical Committee 92 is for audio video equipment and consumer electronics for home product safety standards. This led to the uh, development of IC 60065 uh, that we're familiar with. 
But uh, as you've been noticing the last uh, 20, 30 years, electronic like, products have been coming uh, out faster and faster with more and more abilities and a, a faster pace and standards of being able to keep up with new applications and uh, new implementations uh, of technology, new combinations of technologies. I've just made it so that uh, the old mandated uh, criteria standards are, are not uh, always adequately testing. Have you seen uh, some of the recent failures out in the field with some uh, thermal events and uh, other uh, types of uh, uh, bad failures that uh, really uh, hurt uh, consumers and the market? So the uh, IEC uh, CC7492 joined together and they formed the Technical Committee 108. Which was tasked to develop this hazardous safety engineering standard, and uh, it's covering uh, all the areas of consumer electronics, IT, and communications technology equipment. So this is all your you know, radio receivers, transmitters, uh, and this can be used by consumers. And uh, the environments would include home, office, commercial, and other outdoor locations. Some of these principles were first developed at uh, Hewitt Packard, and uh, they, uh, you'll see a few of the flow charts I have in here later that came directly from their materials. Also, the European Computer Manufacturers uh, Association, or ECMA, was tasked with introducing the first version of the HPSC industry standard, and that's ECMA 287. And I'll have some link for this group, ECMA. The, the, one of the neat things about this organization is they provide copies of these draft standards for free for the downloads from their site. So the main goals that they're trying to accomplish were to cover a wide variety of electronic products as, and fit as many of those in there as they could, and to clearly show the hazards and how they were addressed and mitigated. So this goes along with this, the technology is developing faster and faster with new applications and new materials and new combinations of technologies. Uh, make sure that we're adequately uh, identifying what could be a potential hazard and uh, for those potential hazards, how, how we're making sure that they are, are contained and, and not uh, don't uh, uh, grow into big hazards. And we also want to minimize regional and uh, the uh, uh, national differences in standards. And we also want to uh, make sure there, that we've got the uh, qualified professionals that can understand this and that it's user friendly. So what we're going for on is a prescriptive set of uh, product safety uh, is an IZ6950 or the uh, 60065 for audio video. Uh, things like, you know, specific creepage clearance distances, uh, specific heights for different tests, such as flammability and uh, uh, things like that. And to what we're doing is have a safety engineering. This means we've got to, for each specific product, we've got to look at it and say, what are the possible hazards? Could this thing tip over? Is it a heat hazard? Uh, if, if a, uh, can a child stick their fingers in it? Uh, you know, what, what What are the possible hazards and once we've identified those, how, how can we redesign or uh, in, implement things that's going to mitigate those problems? And it gives more flexibility through performance options for demonstrating compliance. So um, this is a recommended approach for safe products. It does require a different mindset. We're going to talk about some of those things that maybe we can get ourselves stuck out of this uh, prescriptive mode we did, we've been in and see how to really uh, analyze and, and look at these things. Um, one thing that is going to stay uh, consistent is that product safety uh, doesn't care if the product still performs uh, as designed after an event. You know, like if it has a, a failure and it, let's say if there overheats and it shuts down and doesn't come back on, from product safety engineering view, that, that was a good failure. It didn't harm anybody, it didn't catch on fire, it didn't hurt anybody while it was failing, it was contained within the machine. So the Product is allowed to fault and fail as long as it fails safely, and this uh, is you know quite different from if you're looking at reliability or something. You want it to be able to overheat, shut down, cool down, and then come back on. It's a different set of criteria we're looking at. So we're looking at all the typical things product safety is interested in: fire, smoke, heat, shock, uh, you know, mechanical hazards like pinching, uh, shrapnel if the thing you know exploded, and any chemicals that could be contaminants that would harm uh, people or or animals. 
Um, you will note uh, that in the EU, with some of the, the uh, uh, new framework directives, that they're also including not just harm to humans, but harm to domestic animals. So that's another uh, layer of uh, uh, you've got to look at nowadays uh, when you're designing your products that are going to be used in the European Union. So this, uh, the formal name parts, audio, video, information, and communication technology equipment, part one is the safety. Uh, Second edition is the current version, and it uh, was developed by the Technical Committee 108, as we discussed to cover audio, video, ITE, and communications technology equipment. And uh, that's the principal met methodology driving the standard and the uh, requirements within there. And the uh, abstract, you know, so we're dealing with the safety electrical and electronic equipment within the field of audio, and all uh, as being mentioned, ID and communications, for anything that uses rate of voltage of um, less than 600 volts. The standard does not include requirements for performance or functional characteristics of equipment. As we mentioned, this is not a reliability concern. This is just that it's going to be safe to operate, and if it does have a failure, it's going to fail safely without causing harm. This also applies to components and sub-assemblies intended for incorporation in an overall unit that's going to be in this, uh, uh, fall under this hazard-based safety engineering standard. So the component sum assemblies don't have to comply with every requirement standard, but the complete uh, completed system, once it's in the system, that overall system has to. And this also applies to external power supplies um, or any other accessories that are within the scope of the standard. So uh, also from the abstract, uh, so this doesn't apply to power supply systems, which are not an integral part of this equipment, such as motor generator sets, battery backup systems, distribution transformers. You know, so part of the uh, power uh, infrastructure is, is supplying uh, uh, equipment to this. So if you had a backup generator or something like that, it's not looking at that. Uh, it safeguards for three classes of users, ordinary persons, instructed persons, and skilled persons. So. Ordinary person is your basic consumer that's, uh, you know, operating, for example, a cell phone. An instructed person uh, might be somebody that's, you know, uh, been trained on how to, uh, you know, access to change out filters or something like that. Skilled persons, the engineer, technicians who authorize to actually work on these and repair them. Uh, additional requirements may apply for equipment designed or intended for use by children or specifically attracted to children. So. You know, nowadays I've got a uh, two-year-old uh, grandson, and he's already using his parents' uh, smartphone to look up videos on YouTube and watch cartoons and stuff. So uh, a lot of these uh, uh, modern uh, communications devices are being used by children, so you have to make sure that you've got the protection in place for those small fingers, and uh, they have less resistance to shock and voltage hazards than adults do. So there's this... Um, Part two is uh, explanatory information related to there. So it's a guidance document in part two. It's not the actual, if there's a conflict between this part two guidance document and the actual standard, the actual standard wins out and has precedence over it. So this is just intended to help explain some of the concepts and give a better uh, uh, understanding of what's in there because this is a new concept, this is a hazard based uh, approach. And it gives some clauses uh, to consider with uh, other background information. And, um, and this, I mentioned the, the, but the actual standard has precedence over this guidance document. It's fully compatible with the IECEE or CB scheme, as you probably know it. Uh, this is where um, a bunch of international countries have joined, and they will accept this common CB scheme report uh, with the uh, variations for uh, country uh, voltages and, and uh, frequencies. So uh, the, I've laid out the two formal test report forms they've got there uh, for um, these types of products. And you can download those for free from the IECEE website. So it's not a merger of these two uh, standards. It's not like we're taking the audio video 60065 and the ITE 6950-1 and just mashing them together. This was a totally, you know, from scratch building up. Uh, they're not using those for Christmas standards as before. But uh, while it's more performance oriented, it allows for prescribed constructions that they have track record being proven safe. For example, things that are, you know, specific uh, 
constructions that are in 60065 or 60950 and they have a uh, proven track record of being safe and uh, ways to design and develop equipment. And uh, one other caveat is this thing is not generic. It only applies to those products that were designed in scope, ITE, audio video equipment, and communications technologies. It's intended to be technology independent. So no matter what kind of technologies you got in there, you're going to take a look at it. You're going to evaluate for all the possible hazards, and you're going to look at how to mitigate those. So it's not tied to any specific type of technology uh, that's involved in the electronic product you're working on. So this allows for more design freedom. You no longer have, you know, constrained by specific distances and things. If you can prove that you've got a safe design, uh, it'll be able to fail safely. It'll keep uh, users from harm. Then you'll be able to incorporate that as long as it uh, meets all the other requirements. And so they want this to be based on solid engineering principles. What you know, real physics of it. What's happening there with the voltages and current and, and the thermal aspects and all the other uh, potential uh, events that could happen. So what is intended use and expected performance? So you, as you would expect, if this is intended for use on a beach, then it would want to be waterproof and corrosion resistant and things like that. But if it's intended only for home use, it, it might have a lighter set of requirements. Looks at a broader array of electronic products. So they're trying to, you know, as, ever, as we're seeing more and more, whatever products we get, um, in the U.S. or Europe or Japan or wherever they come out at, everybody else in the world wants them. You know, they everybody's looking for the latest and greatest uh, widget that they can uh, use as, uh, with their cell phone technology or whatever it else is uh, they're looking at. Uh, and we're just seeing more and more of this. Uh, the products are just becoming international uh, as they're released. It's striving to be stable and understandable and user-friendly. They're uh, constantly working on uh, trying to make sure if there is confusion in there that they're going to get that uh, updated in the succeeding uh, versions of the standard. And they want it to lead design and manufacture safe products. That's the overall goal. We don't want to hurt people. We don't want to cause things to catch on fire. So uh, that's what we're looking for. For the products that are in the scope, uh, we're using a hazard-based approach and process. Being first, we identify all energy sources in the product. You know, what, where's the voltages uh, coming in at? What's possible current uh, levels they could reach? Uh, you know, what's generating heat? What uh, ca could cause a mechanical hazard? Any of those things. And so once we've got those, we're going to classify them by their effect on the human body or on a combustible material. And uh, it's from uh, and it goes from uh, one to three, one being the least harm, and the three the most uh, most harm. So class one, uh, say it was a voltage you touched, it wouldn't be painful, but you might be able to tell, yeah, I just felt a you know a little bit of uh, a twitch there, and so there's probably some voltage. Uh, it's not likely to uh, ignite something. So if it's a warm spot on your computer, you know it, it might be warm, but it's not enough to uh, cause uh, you know paper or a cotton ball to catch on fire. It's too painful, but does not cause an injury. So you might touch it and, uh, you know, recoil from it. You know, that's what things hot. But it's not going to cause a blister. Uh, it could possibly cause ignition under the right circumstances if you had a high flammable material in the right conditions. Class three is definitely causing an injury. You're going to blister. You're going to have a cut. Uh, and it's more than likely going to catch any uh, combustibles uh, on fire. And that's how you'll lay them out in the report. So for products under the scopes, and uh, so once we've identified the hazards and what level they are, one, two, three, then we're going to have to identify what safeguards we need that are going to protect us, uh, our users and, the, and their environment from that. Remember, we don't want to hurt people. We don't want to burn down their buildings. So uh, what you know, potential uh, things you might have put in there, like maybe more insulation, maybe a uh, uh, better uh, uh, fan system with uh, heat sinks and uh, things to get that temperature down uh, more effectively. And then fourth, we're going to qualify those. So once we say what these are, we've got to go back and test these and make sure they really are effective. Will they really keep that heat from becoming a harmful to human skin, uh, for example, or will they keep the, you know, the desktop from igniting or whatever the case may be? So we're going to use one of these, either performance-based standards or construction-based. As I mentioned, you can use some of the things they 
uh, older tests if you know what those are and they've been proven reliable. This is one of those flow charts I've shown uh, from HP that came out with this. So uh, they've got, you've got to have this path uh, for it to be a, uh, uh, a problem. You've got a hazardous energy source. Say I've got my processor, and it's right, it's right near the back of my uh, uh, portable computer that I've got on my lap. And so what would the transfer mechanism? Okay, it's generating a lot of heat. And if I put that computer on my lap, well, transfer would be through the case. Uh, to my uh, skin. So if I've got it resting on bare skin and it's got a heat high enough to cause a burn or you know first degree burn or something, then I've completed this chain and I've, and I've got an injury. So I've got to do something to mitigate that. So the, we're trying to go from the harm model. So if I do have that case where I've got you know I've got a heat source, it's transferring to my leg and it's, it's causing a blister. Uh, that's then we've got to mitigate that. So the safety is I've got to go back. I've got a harmful energy source. I got to put some additional insulation or I've got to get the processor cooled down more. Uh, and so it can't uh, uh, transfer a hazardous level of heat so that it would harm a person or voltage or whatever the case might be. And these are standard three block models. These are kind of things you can put in uh, when you're doing your uh, 62368-1 uh, reports where you're showing how you're mitigating those risks. And uh, it's just trying to uh, create a picture of what's going on and, and how you're uh, resolving those issues. So the procedure is you want to identify that uh, injury uh, uh, items can cause a uh, uh, any injury uh, by, by energy source. So any you know any voltages, heat, uh, mechanical hazards, you know all those things. Uh, so once you've identified the energy sources, then you got to decide: is it hazard? Could it be hazardous or not? If no, you're you're done with it. No way it could ever be hazardous. If it could, you got to figure out how you know that three block model. So you've got to if you have a hazardous energy source, how could it be transferred to a body part? or do a combustible material. And then and, uh, when you figure that out, then you are got to figure out how to mitigate that by designing safeguard to prevent that energy transfer. Then once you've done that, you've got to measure and test it. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to put an additional layer of insulation and I'm done. Oh, you've got to test it, make sure it's effective. If it's not effective, you've got to go back and uh, through that design cycle and, and, and come up with something better. Go back through the testing. Once it is effective, they're done. And these are the kinds of things you're going to have to uh, identify and, and document in your uh, test reports and, and why, you know, so why uh, the uh, safeguard is in there, uh, how it's going to perform in that function, and, uh, and, and, and what it is uh, actually accomplishing. So you've got to specify the criteria or the construction parameters for a conformance test that demonstrated that effectiveness. So you've got to say, you know, how it's tested and why that is a valid test. and uh, and how you uh, mitigated all those energy sources. So uh, one thing that's real key to HBSE is this risk analysis and field experience review. So uh, that means you, that's part of what you're doing when you're identifying these energy sources and seeing how they could transfer and what the possible outcome would be. That's the risk analysis part. And also you want to use uh, the field experience uh, as it's out there in the field if you uh, get reports of harm uh, coming to customers. You want to make sure that's incorporated back into the design cycle. And uh, if it's you know a, a bad situation, that might lead to a product recall. Uh, but you want to make sure that those uh, uh, products are kept safe, and and you want to be relying on any field uh, information you get from it that goes beyond the initial release of it. So any hypothesis you have that need to be confirmed with laboratory tests. You can't just guess on paper what it, what the problem is and try to fix it that way. You've got to you've got to test. And it's going to consider both the event probability and the consequences. So what's the likelihood of it happening? If it does happen, uh, what are the possible consequences? And we're looking for all the, uh, you know, the standard suspects, electric shock, fire, burn, mechanical, chemical hazards, radiation hazards. So things like uh, electric shock hazards, you're looking at uh, hazardous and non-hazardous valued energy sources. So you know, the voltage currents, you know, how long uh, the duration would be, uh, what the frequencies are, the contact area, and all those types of things. 
for safeguards, it's your insulation coordination. You're, you're still using things like creepage and clearance and solid insulation, but you're not tied to those prescriptive standards anymore. If you, got to, if you can test and show it's effective, then that would be adequate. The protective earthing, your components, your barriers, your enclosures, those are the kind of mechanical things you put in place to, uh, as far as the barriers and enclosures to keep people from being able to access hazardous voltages and the protective earthing makes sure you've got a good ground connection so uh, it's got a path to, uh, to ground that's not through a body. Fire hazards, things like property damage, uh, it's mainly what we're looking at here and find the hazards, not hazardous values of energy sources. So all those things that could cause uh, ignition, uh, something to combust. And so, you know, things like candle flame tests and the other things that we look at. Other safeguards uh, for, for this are the component material selection. You don't want anything that's, you know, you're still uh, look at your levels of insulation, you know, uh, what type of uh, fire retardancy they have inherited in them, the, the functional insulation, any barrier separation or enclosures you're using as fire enclosures to keep uh, flames from escaping out of a chassis or whatever the safeguard you have in place for that. Burn injuries, so this could be high temperatures, uh, molten level, high frequencies as we're getting these higher and higher frequencies, we got to watch for that because they can cause uh, burns in human skin at enough uh, energy. So we got to look to see where hazardous, not hazardous values of these energy sources are. Uh, looking like uh, you know what the temperatures are, the, how it transfers, the, the time, contact areas. Uh, and so we want to make sure we're using the right materials. We've got thermal insulation in there and any barriers or uh, closures that we need to keep that stuff under there. This doesn't include things like chemical burns. Those are uh, handled under the chemical uh, hazards category. Mechanical related injuries, we'll make sure that we don't have any sharp edges, corners, you know, even plastic can cut you. Uh, some of these uh, hardened plastics, uh, when they break, they can have sharp edges on them. So we've got to make sure that we're, we're using proper thickness uh, so that it's not going to break and uh, that we're going to in, uh, in most situations. And that any hazardous moving parts aren't going to be accessible by the uh, uh, customer that we've got fill safes in uh, place, you know, switches or whatever is going to turn the uh, mechanical parts off if the case is open, uh, the possibility of implosion or explosion, uh, since we don't have CRT tubes anymore, it's a lot less of an implosion likelihood, but uh, explosion is still possible with uh, certain types of components, so uh, any instabilities, we want to take a uh, look at those and see what's likely to failure, and if they do fail, uh, what, what the possible consequences of that are. I uh, want to make sure integrity mounting means, so you know, like we, uh, one of the things I always think about is the uh, uh, the wall mounted televisions, you know, how are those mounted well enough that they can come out and fall on a uh, child and harm them. So we got to make sure we have the right stuff in place and that they're, uh, you know, installed by the right levels, uh, skill sets, uh, they're required for those. Radiation related injury, so ionizing radiation, non ionizing radiation are two types we're looking at. And so you might think of like lasers or, uh, you know, other types of uh, uh, radiation that could get out of there. So the ECMA 287 versus existing IC standards address some aspects of this. So if you want more information, you can get that from the ECMA website. And uh, they're developing and standardizing safeguards for other aspects of non ionizing radiation. ECMA uh, Technical Committee 12 is considering those and uh, including those in the uh, future edition of ECMA uh, standard 287. Chemical related injuries, you know, some components can have uh, chemicals in there, some screens, uh, got some exotic materials in there, cause chemical burns, it might be toxic, uh, it might cause an explosion under the right conditions. So we go look at the hazardous and non-hazardous values in there. Make sure we're choosing the right components and materials to contain all that, and that we've got proper ventilation, all the barrier separation. So we're gonna look at chemical resistance of the properties of the shields and stuff we're putting in there and make sure they're compatible with each other. You're not gonna have chemicals in there that react with each other in a unexpected uh, uh, ways, and so we wanna make sure we've looked at those risks. The uh, section format and reports, so you'll have a uh, clause, and so uh, you're going to state the objective of the clause um, in your report and find limits between hazardous and non-hazardous, and uh, you're going to specify the principal safeguards, where they're at, 
uh, what the actual uh, physics of those are as far as their parameters and then how you're uh, testing uh, and constructing those to make sure they're safe. And uh, supplemental safeguards, so this is, you might think of this like your primary and secondary insulation, but we've got uh, primary and, and uh, secondary safeguards in place. So where those are at, uh, how they're constructed, where they're at, and how they're tested. So here's an example from the uh, ECMAS uh, 287. Standard just goes in and uh, says, you know, possible hazards. So this is not kind of mindset you got to have. So if you got batteries, uh, you know, uh, this possible hazard, you know, get shut out. Well, then you can have a, a, you know, high current event, high heat can uh, cause ignition. And this is one of the things we saw with uh, the uh, cell phones over the last couple of years that had these kind of thermal runaway events where they, uh, you know, the product would smoke and catch on fire, and that's not a good thing to happen. And uh, acoustic sound pressure, uh, so I, I've noticed that, you know, the, the, I think the uh, cell phone meters do a lot better of controlling that, having a, uh, controls on the uh, maximum value of the uh, sound pressures coming into the headphones and things like that. You know, for small parts, we know that's a hazard for children, uh, especially children under two years old. So if you've got a, uh, you know, a small screen, a tablet or something that has parts that come up that are uh, below the criteria or less acceptable for children under three, then you've got an issue you've got to resolve with those, either eliminating them or making them larger. So overheating can cause burns. So if you're just looking start shock or startle relax. What if you you know, pick up your phone, you feel a shock, and you drop it. Well, you've damaged your, you know, your phone, and maybe it shocked yourself. Um, where with a laptop or something like that, uh, you want to uh, make sure that you're, you're not doing something that's going to cause a, a problem like that. So optical radiation, such as lasers, you want to make sure you're, uh, you're not damaging anybody's eyes. Hazardous location, so if you're around, you know, if this is intended for industrial use in a petroleum facility, uh, processing facility, you don't want to have anything that could cause explosions and fires. So you really got to look at your, anything that could cause possible spark or a, a thermal event that could uh, ignite. Uh, and uh, for sharp edges and mechanical injuries such as cuts, so these are things we still have to look at, like on printers uh, that, uh, you know, make sure that somebody's fingers aren't going to be sucked in there and crushed or, or, or cut through with tears, those types of things. So it's kind of the approach you have to say, okay, what could be a hazard and what, if it, you know, if it does fail, what's possible uh, consequences? What are those results that can happen from a failure? So the HBSC uh, fault tree models is part of your risk analysis, and this is one of the things uh, that you can do to uh, check at that. So you're going to go through, and uh, this could be included in your report, uh, these kind of flow charts where you put, uh, you know, what what's the... Uh, uh, possible injury uh, uh, that could result from either hazardous injury or um, bodily exposure, and you're going through these OR gates to see, you know, you've got to have down at the bottom either one of those. So you have an equipment safeguard failure, um, starting third from left, or no equipment safeguard. So either one of those could call uh, inadequate equipment safeguards. And if you've got that and you've got a couple other events happening at the same time, uh, so you've got three failures in this and uh, this look on the on the right-hand side. So inadequate equipment safeguard, inadequate personal safeguard, and inadequate personal mail avoidance, all three of those can cause a bodily exposure uh, in this example. And then the, that you can transfer uh, hazardous injury at, uh, to, to a body through both of those, and that's your injury. So it's kind of a different view of the uh, three-block model we were looking at. Well, hazardous energy is the first block in the three-block model. Uh, Bodily exposure is that transfer mechanism uh, in the second block, and then the resulting injury is that third block. But this is a more detailed look at it and the way you can uh, demonstrate it in your reports of this is what would have to happen for injury to occur, and this is what we've done to mitigate that. There's also life cycle implications for this. So the scope responsibilities has been expanded in this standard. Uh, it's got to remain safe for the life cycle of the product. So if there's, uh, you know, a five years after it's issued out there and it has a expected to be out there longer and a defect is uh, found in it, uh, it starts happening after this period of time, the manufacturer is still responsible for uh, resolving those issues with it, making it safe. So uh, maintaining compliance with parts of obsolescence is, some in, uh, is an issue that's going to have to be looked at. 
and uh, other product life cycle implications, this especially in the European Union, is used products and safe social end of life. There's some unanswered questions in this that you've got to uh, take a long view of your products. You can't say, well, I sold it, it's no longer my responsibility. Uh, but made it so that uh, in, that they uh, manufacture, uh, uh, you're mostly responsible for these products until they are safely disposed at the end of life. So you've got hazardous materials in there, you've got to make sure that you've got something in place that is going to uh, be able to take care of those. So here's another look at the HBSE design process, and uh, it's using that three block model, so we've got a uh, you know, a transfer mechanism up here at the top is causing a harm to body uh, part, so it's staying, you know, the nearby energy source and figure out if it's hazardous. If it's not hazardous, you don't have to look at it any further, but if it is, you got to identify this uh, mechanism that's transferring and figure out what to do to mitigate that. And when you mitigate that, then you've got your safeguard in place. You're going to measure it and test it to make sure it actually works. If it's uh, effective, you're done. If it's not effective, you've got to go back through this design loop and make sure that you've got something in place that's going to effectively keep your end users from being harmed by that uh, possible uh, failure or uh, hazard. For your risk analysis, this is a chart that's kind of common with this. So uh, you look at our uh, down at the bottom, it's uh, got the uh, different color codes here. Extremely low uh, risk or severity is uh, the blue. Low risk uh, uh, is uh, green, the moderate for the medium risk, and then high is unacceptable. So you look in here, so these kind of things. So let's look at an event. So I've got, uh, you know, if my uh, both layers of my insulation on my AC cord fell, then uh, I've, got a, I've got a shock hazard, right? So how likely is it to happen? It's, it's possible, right? But I, I doubt that's going to happen. Both layers are going to be breached at the same time. Uh, it might even be unlikely, uh, but it's, it's somewhere in this range for our, our discussion. We're just going to say two. And then you look at what's the risk of that? Well, if I've got line voltage exposed, uh, that's pretty serious or critical, you know. So these are the kind of things you need to identify in your risk analysis. So that would put it, you know, so if it was uh, uh, extremely likely or unlikely, uh, then uh, it's going to fall, or uh, unlikely to fall in this event. If we just say it's possible, then we've got to review for uh, reduction risk benefits. So it depends on where it's going to fall in here, what actions you're going to take. You need to document this in your risk analysis. So if you're challenged by any regulators, you can say this is what you know we found is an issue, and this is how we mitigated or determined that it wasn't an issue. And uh, those are the kind of things that need to be in there. And uh, Oh, here's an example I was just talking about. I didn't realize I had the example in here, but you know, if you got basic insulation and earth barriers, so you got two layers of there. You've got a, a protective bonding connector on the outside of metal chassis carrying that to ground. Um, so uh, you're protected. So an ordinary person, you want to have that reinforced uh, uh, safeguard. Um, you know, and uh, you also may, may want to have basic safeguard supplementary. It's energy class two and it's basic safeguard. If we got a skilled person, we may only need one la level of safeguard. So it depends on what's the uh, the uh, skill level of person. The ordinary user does not expect any real knowledge. A skilled person, you know, uh, or the engineer technician, all these uh, things are going to make up what is what it's used for or what its intended use is and how it's uh, used in those environments. So this is perception thresholds we were talking about, you know, if you perceive um, threshold of perception, threshold of let go, that would be a startle or shock in the gate. And then C zones, threshold of uh, ventricular fibrillation, or it was going to shut your heart down. So we got to, you know, look at this. This is, you know, where are our voltage ranges? We're doing this in the green area, then we're probably okay. But, um, you, might, you know, you might perceive it. Uh, uh, there's a voltage there, but it's not going to hurt you. It's not going to shock, uh, you know, startle you so much that you drop it. But uh, B is would be something you definitely want to get away from. And if you get in the C ranges, then you're risking death, and, and you don't want that to happen. So let's look at, you know, what's our um, a uh, here's a likely one I'm going to look at. Uh, you know, everything's got a battery in it nowadays, uh, along with the wireless module. So 
uh, you know, what's the largest possible impacts? Uh, what's the most likely hazards? So I've got, you know, I could have runaway current if my terminal short out, a high voltage shock if I've got a, 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 a voltage inverter in there for, say, my uh, uh, video screens. I have a fire source in there. Could it cause sparks and ignition? Um, you know, the heat, could it be skin, possible ignition source? Uh, so if I got, uh, you know, light, if I got lasers in there or ultraviolet light, you know, what are the uh, limits on that? You know, that safety that could cut me or pinch me, uh, you know, or uh, crush my fingers. And for wireless charging, you know, you got RF induced energy for that, or there's our concerns, or the other things we're going to have to look at that might cause possible harm. You know, RF energy can cause burns if it's at a high enough level. So, what are the most likely events? So, if I have a, a bunch of batteries, you know, uh, we got heat, fire, current, or shock, probably by most likely hazards. If I have a multi pack shipment, you know, it's like so if you, uh, you've you got one battery in your backpack, probably not a problem if you're aboard a plane. But if they've got a, you know, pallet with a thousand battery, lithium ion batteries on it, and one of them catches and that's the whole thing, you've got a big problem. So that's one of the reasons they don't carry things like that on commercial flights. Uh, what are the main sources of damage? You know, how how could this happen? You know, if you drop the battery, is it going to, is there a risk that it could short out the, the uh, um, and on the cathode to each other and, the, and uh, cause a, a, a shorting event, a high current event that could uh, uh, start a fire. What are typical environments is going to be used in? Is it going to be used outdoors? Is it going to be in a wet environment? It's going to be shielded, uh, uh, you know, from uh, dirt or debris getting into it. What's the range of user types? Remember, if we got children or other system groups, extra precaution must be taken. You know, you'll notice this doesn't, uh, the standard doesn't cover medical devices. That's still covered under the uh, 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 medical uh, standards under the 60601 series. So, uh, you know, uh, people in hospitals have, have, have extra precautions we've got to have for children. If used by children, we've got to watch those uh, energy levels also because they can't withstand the same levels that an adult can. So what is expected operating storage and shipping environments for the product? So we got to also think about, you know, this thing's going to be shipped by Amazon or somebody else. It's going to sit out in the sun if it's coming to me in Texas. So can it handle that? Uh, uh, can it, you know, what are extremes in energy and uh, humidity and uh, temperature that it can withstand without causing a uh, catastrophic failure? And, you know, is this an industrial piece of equipment or is it for uh, consumers? What's going to happen when it's in that truck bouncing up and down? Is that going to cause bad things to happen? So we've got to look at the entire uh, environment that the product is in, not just in the end user's home, but how does it get there, and uh, how does it handle what happens to it once being shipped and being stored? I think I have that one. Huh. Now, for some reason, I have that slide in there twice. So, uh, end user testing is vital to ca uh, fully capture the environment expected ranges. And so, uh, you know, I highly recommend this. You've got uh, some user groups to uh, check this out uh, to make sure, you know, because you may, as an engineer, have, you know, things seem perfectly logical to you how they use it, but don't, don't think, assume anything is like what you think would be common sense or uh, to use it, especially kids. Uh, you know, they'll find, uh, I remember my son growing up, uh, he's in his 20s now, but when he was a kid, he'd, uh, find th things uh, uh, to do with the uh, electronics that I've never had to, uh, considered before, and, and with the computers especially, uh, shortcuts and uh, new ways of doing things that I've kind of was in a rut with doing the same things I've been doing since the 1980s, and, uh, you know, he could do one keystroke for what I was in 34. So make sure you're looking at, uh, not just the engineers are looking at this, but you've got some actual um, end users or test groups looking at these things to find all those possible hazards or ways they use it, it uh, may show that uh, you may need some more safeguards in there than you had considered. So uh, this is uh, kind of fluctuates from time to time, uh, but uh, EU, uh, you're pretty used to start mandating the third edition of this. Uh, sometime we're thinking in the next two years, uh, approximately June 2019, I think is the best day I've seen. And, uh, CC 108 uh, announced the third edition last year, 
uh, with a, a July of 2018 publishing date, so it's expected uh, to replace that second edition from 2014. And we're expecting the uh, a U.S. and Canadian requirements to be in the same time frame, maybe within a year. Uh, so uh, probably before 2020 or sometime right around there. And uh, after you know, U.S. and uh, Canada have got their ocean nurgle and the EU's adopted it, we expect the rest of the world. To start cutting in or maybe announcing also uh, I would expect uh, a lot of the large Asian uh, manufacturing countries like uh, China, Korea, and uh, Japan, uh, Taiwan to be joining in pretty soon. And I expect Australia to follow what the EU does. I usually uh, use that as their model. And so uh, they do have a schedule, but uh, you know was the, the latest update I had for March showed that they're uh, uh, they don't didn't support the it coming out. So this may be delayed, but I wouldn't plan on I plan on a work to make sure that you're educating yourself on how these standards work. Maybe uh, uh, take some uh, uh, time to uh, spend with somebody, um, uh, whoever your uh, certifier is, to get some more information on this and find out better ways to do this. So here's some of those links I promised you. So the uh, technical committee for the IEC uh, TC108, uh, you can go and see their dashboard and uh, see where the developments are on this, uh, their standards, uh, this 62638-1, uh, monitor yourself. It's also the IEC official standards web show uh, where you can buy their standards. You have to purchase those. And there's the CB scheme of the organization is IECEE, and you can learn more about it there. Uh, there's the ECMA link I, sh I gave you, but as I mentioned, ECMA also has uh, downloadable standards for free or draft standards that they've got uh, that you can download, and, and they've got a lot of good information. Uh, I'd recommend you get that as a first start uh, to be learning more about this and download it, your own copy of that and study that. The uh, Underwise Laboratory has an update blog on this standard. And I provided the link there. There's also the OSHA, the U.S. OSHA NERDL test program. You can go to there and find lots of uh, material information on uh, how to implement uh, uh, that and uh, uh, which test labs are uh, authorized to test for the standard or getting on board with that. And also the IEEE has Product Safety Engineering Society, and this is one of the topics they're discussing all the time. And uh, you can get involved with them and keep up with the developing standard is they come through there. All right, uh, thank you all for your time today. I'm going to uh, turn on, unmute everybody, just a second here. Okay, I'm not finding the uh, unmute at all. And I apologize about the uh, audio problems at the beginning. I didn't realize that was going on, but uh, I'm not seeing any uh, questions on the uh, uh, chat button or the uh, Q and A, but uh, so if you do have questions, I'd uh, like for you to uh, send them to me. And I've got my email addresses up here, phone number, and I triple E links for those also. LinkedIn is another good source of information. And uh, I did have one comment that just came through that the uh, implementation date has been uh, moved to 2020. Uh, so I'll try to look that up and see if I can find that. There was a question about risk and S S assessment for those users with uh, EN 12100 and uh, EN 
14.121, the European norms, European standards. Um, I'm not sure, but I will look up and see if I can find it and send it out to the attendees. As I mentioned, we will be providing a PDF copy of today's presentation to all that attended. Okay, I'm checking the questions one more time. And uh, Now somebody asked if you were releasing a new product in the middle of 2018, uh, should you use EN6950 or EN62368-1? Uh, as it looks now, I would go ahead and use the older standards. Uh, but once those uh, come into effect, and if they do implement them as uh, a total replacement, uh, it means about two years later, if that product was still in the market, you'd have to do that. So it depends on the life cycle of the product you're going to be releasing and how long you think it's going to be out there. I know when I was working at Dell, we talked about life cycles in terms of six months to a year. So it just depends. Okay, thank you all for your time. Uh, Please feel free to contact uh, with all the information provided on the screen. And I want to remind you about some upcoming events next year with the IEEE, if you're interested in those. That will be in the presentation also. Well, thank you for your time and for joining us here. Be sure to check out upcoming events on the Washington Laboratories uh, training site at the www.w LA.com. Thank you for your time, and we'll talk to you later.